Greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from, or find the video version on the John Campia YouTube channel. That's right, the Designing Hollywood podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, imagination connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your master of fun and wonder. Your viceroy of verisimilitude, your sommelier of sci-fi and cinema, your evangelist of the imagination, your archbishop of Banterbury, the as-yet-undefined existential, Mr. Rogers, me, Robert Meyer Burnett. And this is Observations, episode number 811, 811 episodes. That seems excessive. Maybe it is excessive, I don't know. But it's amazing to be here, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, gentle beings, kind souls, however you identify across these, the 28 known galaxies. We're going to talk some Black Adam tonight. I got viewer letters. I got lots. I was going to talk about horror, but I'm going to do that tomorrow night. Uh, Black Adam, of course, opens tomorrow for all to see. I've been told it's like a 90s action film mixed with a modern superhero movie. That even has a slightly political bent, if you're looking for that sort of thing. I'm excited to see it. You know, I've been a fan of the Shazam family. I mean, it used to be called the Marvel family. Mary Marvel, all that. Uh, Captain Marvel. Shazam was, of course, Captain Marvel. There was the Saturday morning cartoon. No, it wasn't a cartoon. It was a live action Saturday morning Shazam show with two different actors that played Shazam. Uh, and it was called Shazam. But Shazam is an acronym. It was actually Captain Marvel. Of course, there's a Marvel Captain Marvel. There was Marvel. There's Carol Danvers. There's a whole bunch of Captain Marvels. So now in the DCEU, it's just Shazam, which is, I guess, poetic justice if you're thinking about that kind of thing. Very exciting. But some interesting things about Black Adam. There was an article that dropped in Variety this afternoon at... Uh, at just after 3 p.m. this afternoon, and this is interesting, and I thought I would, would share it with you because it harks back to things we've been talking about on the John Campia show, and uh, yeah, so here is the article that I was discussing. Uh, Zach Scharf wrote this, Superman fighting Black Adam is not a one-off movie, but a new long form of storytelling, not a one-fight movie situation um by the way this article has a spoiler alert but it's not a spoiler alert to anybody that might watch the show or any show on the internet or has been on the internet because Dwayne the Rock Johnson has been talking about this all week long so let's get into it much of the weeks leading up to the release of Black Adam has been dominated by Dwayne Johnson touting his eponymous comic book character's future fight against Superman Johnson has all but confirmed that his Black Adam movie will reintroduce Henry Cavill as Superman after he took on the role in such films as Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, Dawn of Justice, and Justice League. But Black Adam producer Hiram Garcia recently told Cinema Blend via Collider that a Superman vs. Black Adam fight won't just be defined by a one-off movie. It's never been about a one-off or just a fight, said Garcia, who has been Dwayne Johnson's longtime producing partner on films such as Jumanji, Hobbs and Shaw, and more. No, it's about so much more than that, Garcia added. We really want to craft a long form of storytelling and show that these two characters exist in the same universe and are going to have to deal with each other often. 
either the same or on opposite sides. Hopefully they're going to clash at some point. But it's not just about a one fight situation. That was never our dream. That does not reward the fans. Fans want to feel a journey between these guys knowing that these guys exist in the same universe. Dwayne Johnson told Cinema Blend earlier this month that the whole point of bringing Black Adam to the big screen in his own standalone movie is so that one day he can make a Black Adam versus Superman movie. Johnson stressed that, I've been listening and I've been wanting to address fans for years regarding the desire to have Black Adam and Superman fight on the big screen. I've been waiting for someone to step up and address the fans and say, hey, we hear you, Johnson added. So finally, after many months turned into many years, uh, Dwayne Johnson reported that it took six years. Now, I have, uh, let's call this person a very highly placed source in Hollywood, someone that I trust implicitly who is in the know. And this person reached out to me a couple days ago and said that we had it all wrong on the John Campia show about the lack of Henry Cavill in the DC EU. This person, again, a very highly placed source, one of the most highly placed sources at Warner Brothers outside the studio. Let's say they've done a lot of work at the very highest levels with the studio. Told me in an email, expressly said that when they were making Shazam, the first Shazam movie, the plan was always to have Henry Cavill cameo at the end of Shazam. Indeed, we see Superman at the end of Shazam. We see the iconic Henry Cavill Superman outfit, and somebody's wearing it, but it's not Henry Cavill. We never see his face. Now, this very highly placed source at the studio, or works with the studio, works with Warner Brothers, doesn't just work with Warner Brothers, works with multiple studios. <laughs> uh, this person told me that uh when they were trying to get Henry Cavill to cameo in that movie that his manager said look he had more contractual obligations more appearances as superman on the books but if he appeared in a cameo as superman that would count as one of Henry Cavill's contracted appearances in a movie as superman this was Henry Cavill's manager who said this. Interestingly enough, that manager is also Dwayne Johnson's ex-wife and his manager as well. As a result of that, because he wouldn't play ball with the studio, he was playing hardball, Toby Emmerich, who was running Warner Brothers at the time, said Henry Cavill is now persona non grata. He's not going to play ball with the studio. He will never be Superman again. Toby Emmerich is gone. He is no longer at Warner Brothers. So the six years that Dwayne Johnson has been trying to get Henry Cavill in a Black Adam movie or in a movie at all, that impediment has been taken away. It's another reason uh, why this person told me that <laughs> many people don't like Toby Emmerich or what he was doing at Warner Brothers and will not be sorry to see him gone now. I th thought that was interesting. So Dwayne Johnson goes on in this article and says, uh, the whole point of bringing Black Adam, bringing Black Adam to the big screen in his own standalone movie is so that one day he can make a Black Adam versus Superman movie. I've been waiting for someone to step up and trust the fans and say, hey, we hear you, Johnson added. So finally, after many months turned into many years, we ended up with what we ended up at. And the whole goal and intention now is this new era, this new time. Let's build out. Johnson's Black Adam movie also stars Aldous Hodge, Noah Sent. Uh, Centineo, Sarah Sh uh, Shahi, uh, Marwan Kanzari, and Pierce Brosnan. The film opens tomorrow from Warner Brothers. So that's pretty fascinating. Now, what's interesting is I have been saying, and, and I didn't actually know this, I was just talking off the top of my head, uh, that, you know, you could use Shazam and Black Adam and make a Kingdom Come movie. For those who don't know what Kingdom Come is, it is a very famous DC comic series written by Kirk Busiek, and it has art by the great Alex Ross, and it's set in the future when all of our the pantheon of DC heroes are older. Superman is now taking care of Smallville, what's left of it, and it's about the clash between old multi-generations of superheroes, and Superman fights Shazam 
in this. It is an epic battle. And it doesn't end well for Shazam, who actually saves a lot of people. Here's Alex Ross's rendition of Black Adam. And how could you not, if you're Dwayne Johnson, want to play Black Adam? But what's really interesting is Hiram Garcia, who I just read, who said the the plan was to um, make a build out. He said build out. He said this in on December 31st, 2021 to uh, this was CBR, CBR.com. Black Adam boss wants to make a Kingdom Come movie. Black Adam producer Hiram Garcia says the film's production company has long waited to make a film adaptation of DC's Kingdom Come. Now, they have not been saying that in the lead-up to the release of the film. They've not been saying that to the press. But I'll read this article. Hiram Garcia, co-producer of Warner Brothers' upcoming Dwayne Johnson-led DC extended universe film Black Adam, says his dream project would be a film adaptation of the classic DC Elseworlds tale, Kingdom Come. Garcia, the president of Johnson's Seven Bucks Productions, which is producing Black Adam alongside New Line Cinema, Flynn Pictures Company, and DC Films, discussed Kingdom Come during a recent interview with Collider. Look, I think the dream project that's something we've always spoken about at Seven Bucks, we would love to make someday, which is um, a tougher ambition to do, obviously, to IP and rules and so forth, but have always been obsessed with, obsessed with is Kingdom Come. Did I say Kurt Busiek? I did. The Mark Wade alex Ross joint that those guys did, he said. Uh, I think the storyline was always so compelling, Garcia. I can't believe I made that mistake. I'm sorry. I apologize to everybody. I throw myself on the court. I think that storyline was always so compelling, Garcia continued. We've always envisioned it as kind of an epic multi-film saga. I think that's something we've always dreamed of being able to do. If there was ever a dream project and not trying to start a fire where it's like we're gunning after that because it's just pie in the sky, you'd love to be able to tell the story. And I always admired that story of the juxtaposition of old school heroes versus new school heroes and how they clash and a world so divided in terms of how they view what is justice now and what it is and what it should be. It's always just something very compelling in the big cataclysmic mashup of old versus new. That's something that look in a perfect world, we could do it. We would love to do it. Written by Mark Wade and Alex Ross, illustrated by Ross and lettered by Todd Klein, Kingdom Come was originally published as a four-part limited series under DC Comics Elseworlds imprint in 1996, along with The Long Halloween, which came out in 96, which we talk about on tonight's Weekly Hero. A meta-commentary on the gritty comics boom of the 1990s, Kingdom Come is an alternate reality story that pits the aging, out-of-touch superheroes of old against a new generation of dangerous, irresponsible vigilantes with pot potentially world-ending results. While there has yet to be a full-blown Kingdom Come adaptation, Wade and Ross's comic has been referenced in live-action DC projects. For example, the CW's 2019-2020 Arrowverse crossover event, Crisis on Infinite Earths, saw Brandon Routh reprise his role as Clark Kent Superman from the 2006 film Superman Returns, this time sporting the Man of Steel's Kingdom Come attire. It was also as part of Crisis on Infinite Earths that legendary Bruce Wayne Batman voice actor Kevin Conroy played the character in live action for the first time. In Crisis, Conroy portrayed an aging Bruce Wayne who was confined to a robotic exoskeleton, not unlike the one the character was forced to wear in Kingdom Come. Finally, the 2020 DCEU feature film Wonder Woman 1984 saw Gal Gadot's Diana Prince don the character's iconic gold armor, which first appeared in Kingdom Come. It remains to be seen if Garcia and the rest of the Seven Bucks team will get their wish of adapting Kingdom Come at some point down the road though the company certainly has a solid slate of upcoming DC films in the meantime. In addition to Black Adam, which is due to hit theaters on July 29th, 2022, I mean, if you think about this, this was back in 2021, it's not that far away. Seven Bucks is producing DC's League of Super Pets and Shazam! Fury of the Gods, which are scheduled for release on May 20th, 2022, and June 2nd, 2023, respectively. Whereas Black Adam stars Johnson... As the titular anti-hero, League of Super Pets stars the ex-WWE stars the voice of Crypto the Superdog. Seven Bucks previously had a hand in 2019's Shazam. Now, I find this really, really interesting. I had forgotten that Seven Bucks was involved with uh, Shazam. And here's the thing. 
So really, for seven bucks, they now have three films dealing with the DCEU. Two Shazam movies, they got Fury of the Gods coming out, and Black Adam now. So they've created a Shazam-verse that is inside the DCEU, a trilogy, if you will, that's already completed. And we're going to be introduced to Black Adam and the Justice Society, which presumably, the way things are now, it's more like what happened at the end of Crisis on Infinite Earths when there was a, indeed, a um, all the heroes were together on one Earth. Well, already you have Adam Smasher, Hawkman, Dr. Fate, in addition to Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman, Ben Affleck's Batman, Jason Momoa's Aquaman, and you could introduce, maybe over the course of other movies, you have the young Shazam family that could find themselves, or the Marvel family that could find themselves at odds with Shazam, and instead of making, well, if you've read Kingdom Come, I don't want to ruin it because it's one of the great comic book experiences of your life that you haven't had yet, What's really interesting is if Black Adam took the place of Shazam, and you've already got young whippersnapper heroes. So it's very, very interesting. Like, i just been spouting off in the John Campia show about a Black Adam movie uh, with turning into it, turning it into Kingdom Come. I really hadn't realized until I delved into it that this, this is certainly, they're three films deep now. Now, and why not? You've, you've, you've got Flash coming out. Flashpoint, you've got Aquaman coming out. If they do another Henry Cavill Superman, the DCEU never really went anywhere. We've still been getting the DCEU movies. So we've got now, pardon me, we've got two Wonder Woman movies, two Aquaman movies, the Zack Snyder Justice League trilogy. So that's seven movies right there and three. So there are now 10 DCEU movies and if you include Suicide Squad 1 and 2, that's 12. And the Peacemaker series is a series inside the DCEU. So if I'm not forgetting anything, oh, there's Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey, 13. So, and then this is, I mean, I now that I'm seeing where all this is going, this is pretty interesting. And in terms of leading up to a Kingdom Come, that's a Kingdom Come movie is an Avengers level event for Warner Brothers. Now, I don't know, with Walter Hamada no longer at, at the new DC, the formed sp spinoff of DC Studios, or DC Studios is now a spinoff of Warner Brothers, this is a fascinating place to be. Um, if they're leading up to a Kingdom Come film, and by the way, that does not mean they can't make other movies in the DCEU, because a Kingdom Come movie takes place down the line. And is that where it all winds up? Who knows? You could do a Kingdom Come movie and set it 20 years from now, 10 years from now, however you want to do it. I don't know. But if DC was smart, and I think whoever runs DC probably is going to be, um, as I've said, everyone's like, well, DC needs their Kevin Feige. I don't think there is anyone like Kevin Feige. Uh, as, as I've said for years, Kevin Feige produced 14 Marvel projects before Iron Man in 2008 including movies like Elektra and the Man-Thing movie nobody talks about. But it was out there. You can find it. So this is a very interesting turn of events. And um, I, for one, am really interested to see where it's all going to go. I don't quite know where it is all going to go, but it's, it's pretty interesting. So we shall see. I mean, what's, what's really interesting is... Um, now, I can understand the thing about Shazam is Shazam becomes the villain in Kingdom Come. And if you guys have never read or seen Alex Ross's comic work, let me just show you a picture. Uh, uh, this picture, if you were to show this, I think, to a studio executive and ask them, what do you think of this? Now, look at this picture. Here's Shazam confronting or Captain Marvel Shazam confronting Superman. Imagine that, I mean, they might want to go this way with Shazam, but they don't necessarily, I mean, I would say that if you had Superman and Black Adam fight in one movie and knowing their rivalry, look at that, look at this image. Imagine that, imagine Dwayne Johnson in this place and right out of a movie, who wouldn't want to see that? There's Henry Cavill, a little older, a little grayer, confronting Dwayne Johnson. I mean, right there. 
that should sell your movie to a studio. It's very exciting. And um, look, I'm not saying that they're going to announce a Kingdom Come movie tomorrow. I wouldn't be surprised, though, if they do announce, assuming Black Adam does well. And when I say does well, probably has to make between 500 and 600 million worldwide to be considered a, the bona fide hit, I suppose. If we see that, I wouldn't be surprised if an announcement comes pretty soon after that that there is going to be a Black Adam versus Superman movie with the director, uh, Jama, of Black Adam, uh, Jama Collette, that, that it could happen. And I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it probably could because, look, DC, DC Studios is now rudderless. I don't see someone suggested Chuck Roven can take over. No, what you need is you need a Feige. You need a geek that has a lot of experience producing movies. There are not very many people like that in the whole motion picture industry that are acceptable at the studio level. So that's that's the big thing, at the studio level. You need someone not just who's like a writer of comics. You need somebody that has the skill set to do deals, to, to do deals with talent, to do deals with production companies, all kinds of deals, and has made motion pictures and also is good in a room and also can deal with a studio. There aren't a lot of people like that and uh, in the world. So David Zaslav and the people over at Warner Brothers Discovery have their work cut out for them. I don't know if, if it will happen. Who knows? A superhero displays became, uh, has been a member of the channel for 12 months. So I want to thank you for that. He didn't send in a super chat. He just uh, he just sent in his his. Uh, I think he re-upped his membership. Thanks for becoming a member of the channel, Superhero Displays. You are of course a great friend. You've sent me a fantastic gift. Actually, two two fantastic gifts. If um, if we're going to be technical about it. Now, as many people know on the show, if you're new to the show, I read letters. That is correct. I read letters from you viewers, and I have a letter to read. Um, I actually have a couple letters to read. This letter comes from Ivan. Hello, Robert and the Post Geek Singularity community. I am Ivan from Dubrovnik, Croatia. Dubrovnik, Croatia, where they shoot Game of Thrones. Firstly, I would like to say how much I miss Rob's observations in Midnight Metal. While I like you on the John Campia show, your shows are on another level. With your shows, I feel such warmth, like my big brother is giving me valuable life advice. It is you that led me to my now favorite directors, Andre Tarkovsky, Wong Kar Wai, and Terrence Malick. I would also like to add Emmanuel Lebeski there, even though he is not a director, but it's like he, uh, Chivo, but it's like he manages to capture the soul of everything he films. With you, I learned so much, not only about movies, but storytelling and emotions in general. Every listener gains a free mentorship. I, by the way, I did not write this letter. <laughs> this is really from Ivan from Dubrovnik, Croatia. I would like to write about a small gripe I have with your opinion. Uh-oh, here it comes. About Zack Snyder's DC movies. I remember you once saying that they are like a heavy metal album cover come to life. You may not have scenes like Natasha and Steve talking in Endgame in them, but you like them. I disagree. In my opinion, there is nothing in the superhero genre that comes close to the sheer beauty of the human soul as portrayed in Zack Snyder's movies. For example, in Man of Steel, where Clark comes home and says to his mother that he found his parents, and his mom telling him how the truth about him is so beautiful, and how she would listen to him breathe as a baby, and worried all the time that someone would take him away. And Clark hugs her. And then, in Batman v Superman, he gives her a call when he is at his lowest, just wanting to hear her voice. These movies are filled with scenes like these, especially Zack Snyder's Justice League. Although they are far from perfect, there is a Terrence Malickian feeling to them. The greatest hope and inspiration comes when we journeyed through the darkest times, and that's why I think these are the most hopeful superhero movies. I have seen so many messages from across the world how they help people with their mental state, and it doesn't surprise me. They touched me as well. 
There is a reason Zack Snyder has a big, passionate fan base, and it is not because of the cool visuals, although they are cool. It is because of the way he approached these characters, with such tenderness and beauty. Sorry for the big letter, Rob. Hopefully you will get a chance to read it. I bid you goodbye now and leave with this inspirational message from Zack Snyder's Justice League. The world is hurt, broken, unexchangeable. The world's not fixed in the past, only the future. The not yet. The now. The now is you. Now, now is your time to rise, to do this, be this. The man I never was, the hero you are. Take your place among the brave ones, the ones that were, that are, that have yet to be. It's time you stand, fight, discover, heal, love, and win. Wow, Ivan, only a European could write something like that. Uh, first of all, I want to thank you for writing in. F uh, thanks for the letter. It's great. Now, now, Ivan, I got to tell you, you, the fact that you have became, uh, you become a fan of Wong Kar Wai, Andre Tarkovsky, and Terrence Malick, this is why I do this kind of show. This is why I, I, Elizabeth wanted me to go on YouTube. This is why other friends of mine suggested I go on YouTube. I mean, it's one thing as anybody who has um, watched this show for any length of time, my show, um, Rob Observations, knows that it's more of a different kind of a show than just YouTube um, movie news shows like we do on the John Campy show, which I really like doing. It's a lot of fun. But what this channel is about is really to celebrate I mean, I want to take the things that I love, uh, aside from modern Star Trek, I know it's my one blind spot where I'm not going to be happy about it, except Guard Season 3, um, to bring the things that I love to you guys, to, to hopefully share the things that I get excited about, because I feel that, especially today, more than ever, um, uh, more than ever, so much of the good stuff that's out there is being lost. And I think because as I was growing up and be becoming a fan of this stuff, uh, I was exposed to so much of it, and now <coughs> uh, it dominates the landscape, but so much of the good stuff has sort of been lost, and people have to seek it out. So if if, if I was tasked with something, it is bringing, bringing, uh, bringing the new or, or new to people. I want to share the things that I've been enthusiastic about my whole life. So to hear you tell me that your, your new favorite directors are Wong Kar Wai, Terrence Malick and Andre Tarkovsky warms my heart. Um, Tarkovsky made three what I would consider to be science fiction or speculative films. One is, of course, Solaris. Everyone calls it the Russian answer to 2001, although it really isn't that. Solaris is based on Stanislaw Lem, a Polish science fiction writer, his novel of the same name. It's a great film. It was, of course, remade by Steven Soderbergh with James Cameron producing with George Clooney in the lead role. Uh, Tarkovsky made another movie after that called Stalker that is based on another uh, a, a Russian science fiction novel by Arkadian Boris Strugatsky called Roadside Picnic. Now, Stalker, and I say this with all affection, I love Stalker, but it's like watching paint dry. It's really a difficult watch. And in order for, and, and I, I don't mean to be disparaging of anyone out there, but I, I will tell you, you have to have some kind of patience. You have to put your mind in a whole different mindset to watch Stalker and get anything out of it. It's tough sit. I love it, but I will admit it. It's hard to watch. Not that it, it's just hard to watch because it's just, a, it's, it's, you'll see if you watch it. And the last movie that Tarkovsky made that I would recommend to Imagination Connoisseurs was, unfortunately, his final film, The Sacrifice, which I think is even more accessible almost than, than Solaris, but um, I don't want to tell you what The Sacrifice is about, but it's very interesting. But again, these are uh, it's a Russian filmmaker with an entirely different outlook on cinema. It's much more poetic uh, than anything and, you know, not easy to sit through. Uh, Wong Kar Wai is one of my favorite directors, one of the great romantics of the cinema. Maybe you've heard of his movies in the mo in the mood for love. Quentin Tarantino famously brought Chung King Express to America through his distribution company Rolling Thunder, which existed for a while in the '90s. Uh, if you want to watch, I highly recommend Chung King Express. I love it, and get it's kind of got a sequel 
Um, it was supposed to be part of Chungking Express, but part of it was turned into its own movie called Fallen Angels. And if you really want to get, and again, you kind of have the soul of a romantic, really. Um, but it's set in contemporary Hong Kong. Very, very interesting. But Wong Kar Wai also did a sort of a pseudo sequel to In the Mood for Love uh, uh, 2049. Was it 2048? 2049? Blade Runner? Maybe it was 2048. 20 um, something. <laughs> but check that out too. There is a great Criterion box set. He made a film uh, called Happy Together that's a wonderful, wonderful movie. Uh, just look up any of Wong Kar Wai's movies are great. Days of Being Wild. I mean, just check them out. You'll love them uh, if you want. But And then Terrence Malick, of course, Badlands, Days of Heaven. My favorite Terrence Malick movies are Badlands, Days of Heaven, The New World, and I love his new version of Tree of Life. Love it. And um, Ivan, thank you, sir, for writing in. What a great letter. Uh, very much appreciate it. So... Thanks very much, and uh, you're, you're, most, you're most kind, so thank you. Um, Shy Potsy, Shy Potsy sent in a, uh, a super chat that says, Hey Rob, can you talk a bit about what Marvel character you would like, a, you would like to get a headlining trilogy next in the MCU? That's a, good, that's a good question. You know, all of my answers now to the MCU question are X-Men characters. Um, I love the X-Men. And obviously, you've got your core X-Men characters. You've got Cyclops, you've got Jean Grey, you've got Beast, you've got Iceman. I mean, those to me, Storm maybe with the new X-Men. Um, I don't know if you go with the, the classic team or, or add a few more, because we've seen those in X-Men movies. But I would love to see even the peripheral characters. I mean, John always talks about how he loves Bishop. That's an interesting, I mean, I really like the whole Bishop storyline coming from the future and Trevor Fitzroy and, and those characters. I'd love to see a long shot movie. I loved long shot, but then again, it might be a little goofy, but um, again, I would love to see, I've said this before, even though we have a trilogy of Wolverine movies, I think I would love to see maybe not a trilogy, but, I think we need a another Wolverine movie. I, if I was if I was in charge of the X Men, I would redo a Wolverine movie, and I would have Wolverine come out of the Weapon X program, and I would have Alpha Flight. I would literally introduce Alpha Flight in the Wolverine, the first Wolverine movie, and have Wolverine lead us just like in Brian Singer's first X Men twenty two years ago, lead us to the X Men and build out from there. But if I could do any MCU movie right now, probably Wolverine and Alpha Flight together. Because I love Alpha Flight. But I, I, the further we get along, I, and I love the MCU. I, 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 like everyone else, Phase 4 has left me a bit cold because I don't know where they're going. It seems a little aimless and directionless. And for the very first time, uh, Thor Love and Thunder was a, an, a, a movie I, I actively did not like at all. So... Um, yeah, <laughs> um, but that that's probably, that's where I would go. That's where I would like to go. Um, Comic Boom says the X-Men are oversaturated. The MCU is making a huge mistake by making X their focus. I don't think the MCU is necessarily making mutants their focus. Um, but I think, look, the X-Men are, the, the thing about the, the Fox X-Men is that we had, they were all over the place. Like X-Men and X2 were great. I love Days of Future Past. I even, to a certain extent, like a lot of Apocalypse. I think it just didn't go anywhere. Um, but ultimately, I would like to see the X-Men done with tight continuity. And frankly, I I was, I'd lost all interest in the X-Men comics because I'd been reading for so long until Hickman came along and did House of X and Power of X. I thought that the concepts were crazy. It, um, it's, it's, uh, and, and now, <laughs> the MCU, the comic universe, don't know, have no idea <laughs> where they are. But I did like X, uh, House of X and Power of Ten, or Power of X. So, that's kind of where I'd want to go, Shy Potsy. I mean, frankly, to be honest, everyone knows I love Moon Knight. I did not like what they did with the series. Oscar Isaac was great. But I really didn't, I really didn't like the Moon Knight series, ultimately. Um, a lot of people did, but... 
I was not really, did not dig it. Uh, Binary Sunset Media says, Dear God, Zack Snyder's superhero films, hopeful? Yikes. Well, here's here's the thing. Um, here's what I would say about Zack Snyder's. Like, I love Man of Steel. And the reason I love Man of Steel is because I looked at it more uh, as a first contact story. I've talked about this a lot. Uh, and I had absolutely no problem. Uh, Earth was facing extinction. Zod and his and Keora and his team were going to wipe humanity off the face of the Earth. Earth was a, facing an extinction-level event. And Clark, Kal-El, had been Superman for about a week. He didn't. He had no concept of truth, justice in the American way. He didn't even have... I mean, he had a good father in, in Jonathan Kent. But, I mean, he hadn't even... He didn't know who he was yet. He, he was a newly minted person that just found out he had an alien origin. And then suddenly, aliens are on Earth, and he's fighting against them. And here's the thing. The horror of superhero battles... They're not, they would not be fun. If you had superheroes, I mean, look, they were fun when, when the Chitari and Loki attacked New York in Avengers. But if you saw the kind of loss of life that was suffered, I mean, people were being saved, but people died. We just didn't see them. Zack Snyder chose to show us what would actually happen if people were being thrown through buildings. It, the carnage would be unbelievable. And I've never accepted the fact, well, Rob, you know, Superman would never let civilians die. Superman wasn't thinking about anything other than defeating somebody that was trying to kill him. He didn't have time to worry about civilians yet. He 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 was he he, he just learned to fly. But anyway, I think the thing that that uh, why Ivan responded to Zack Snyder. Look, I love Zack Snyder's Justice League. I was a little. I I thought that Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice. The real problem with Zack Snyder's. I think Zack Snyder's movies um, is that there's not a lot of lightheartedness to them. They're very operatic, um, like Italian operas are. They're very operatic, and um, they're in a way they're sort of tragedies, and they're dealing with these grand themes. There's not a lot of uh, street level humanity in Zack Snyder's movies. He's dealing with these sweeping, he's making like uh, Goethe Damerung, he's doing Wagner. He's doing these, these, these gods are battling. And because what people want is, even though people talk about this human, too much humor in the MCU, people want the humanization of their superheroes. Because there is an element that you want Superman to be your friend. He'll rescue your cat out of a tree. The Zack Snyder's Justice League and Zack Snyder's Superman movies are not concerned with that. These are characters that exist on a higher plane than humanity does. That's why, like, the reason I really loved, I really love Zack Snyder's Justice League for that reason, the operatic nature of it all. It doesn't take place in our world. I mean, while it, it, it there is humanity and there is the Earth, it takes place in a heightened realm where the gods are battling and even though it lasts too long i mean the sax size justice league could use some trims but when aquaman puts to sea after he talks to batman and you have the the women singing as as he's going off i mean that's you might as well be in a church and and all of humanity is singing to their saviors i mean it literally is that it's a different vibe now i can understand why ivan responds to those kinds of things because it depends where you come from We approach someone like Superman. Superman might as well be playing baseball and eating your mom's apple pie. The thing is, Zack Snyder, uh, as a visual stylist, is working on a different plane of existence. And the superheroes and in Zack Snyder's universe, the superheroes are battling literally in heaven. They're battling at the top of Mount Olympus. He's dealing with beings that are far, far removed from the humanity that we know. And that's why I liked him. I, you know, watching a Zack Snyder superhero movie was literally like opening the pages of an Alex Ross comic for the first time, whether it was Kingdom Come. Yes, written by Mark Wade. Sorry, I don't know. Kurt, Kurt, I was thinking something else. You know, and it's funny because I've got multiple copies of Kingdom Come, even a slipcase one right over there. But Mark Wade, I, 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 I will never live that down because somebody's going to get to this video and they rewatch it and go, you know, Rob, it was not... Kurt, it was Mark Wade who wrote it, so yes, it's a mistake. So, um, 
anyway, that that's kind of why. And and a lot of a lot of um, uh, that's that that's why I can I can understand loving Andre Tarkovsky and loving Juan Kar Wai and loving Terrence Malick and also loving Zack Snyder's Justice League. I would say this, you know, I don't think that I think that Zack Snyder as a filmmaker, if he has any shortcomings, he's not a great intellect in terms of a thinker. He's a great visual stylist and and he really responds and he's able to I don't think he's a great adapter. I think he's a great recreator. Watchmen is a great recreation of the comic, but it's not a very good adaptation of the comic because it has too much of a slavish devotion to the actual comic itself without really understanding that the Watchmen comic book is an actual deconstruction of the entire medium of comic books, which when you're translating it to film, that is lost because it's not a movie. I mean, it's not, it's not, the movie's not dealing with comics. So, um, but anyway, I can see why people really respond to Zack Snyder and why there's a passionate fan base, because in my mind, Zack Snyder's superheroes of the gods or the superheroes as gods, that's how I thought of superheroes even when I was a kid. And that's what I really love to see. And the thing about Kingdom Come, especially that final battle, and I can understand, I would love to see Black Adam and Superman fighting. Hell, you know what? <laughs> if they ever make that Kingdom Come movie, I, I would love to see Zack Snyder direct it because he would bring that mythical quality to the visuals um, at the end. But anyway, um, so that Binary Sunset Media goes on to say, I agree, I like Man of Steel if I skip the ending. After breaking Zod's neck to save a family, Superman looks up and screams because that family is dead. That's Zack Snyder. Well, I mean, you know, I, I don't I don't necessarily agree with that because this idea that people wouldn't die during that kind of a battle, or, I, I mean, Zod, it, what was... Here's the question I always ask. In the context of that movie, what was Superman supposed to do with Zod? You can't imprison him anywhere. You know, it's not like he doesn't have some kind of a crystal container you can trap them in and take away their powers or a crystal container that you can get into to protect you from something taking away their powers. I mean, they can't. What are you going to do? Zod had to die. They all had to die. There was nothing you could you could do. Uh, Superhero Displays sends in a super chat and says, what a beautiful letter. And I completely agree. Yeah, I thought it was a beautiful letter, too. Binary Sunset Media goes on to say, I did like his JLA but he totally wants to make the Fountainhead for a reason. That's uh, Ayn Rand. And if you haven't read Atlas Shrugged or the Fountainhead or her uh, novel uh, Anthem, Anthem Anthem is a different author, Neil Stevenson, Anthem, uh, check those out. I mean, it's very funny because Ayn Rand's books of sort of Ayn Rand have fallen from favor as of late. But um, I think there's something to be said for objectivism. Watch, I'll get canceled for saying that. <laughs> but you can. Uh, Binary Sunset Media goes on and says 100%. I agree. Shy Potsy says, I'm bummed out over Black Adam. Will admit I usually dislike DC films as opposed to Marvel. However, with The Rock, I was very intrigued and hoping for better. Guess I will see for myself. I do think it will be an economic failure at the end of the day, though. I hope it's not. I hope it's not. I, look, I, I don't want any movie to be an economic failure. So many people nowadays, especially on these superhero movies, so many people around the world now put their time and their effort into these works. And I want them to succeed. I want them to succeed. So let's see. Uh, tips. People have been sending in tips as well. Uh, if you want to send in a tip as opposed to a super chat, there's a link down below. Sergio, link in the description. Sergio C says, hey, Rob. I saw you and John talking about the Black Adam box office earlier, and I believe that it will even do better than expected because of the MCU being a little stale right now. Thor 4 and She-Hulk were not received well, so maybe DC will have a chance. Well, you know what? I mean, on the other hand, you've got a gigantic movie star in The Rock named Dwayne Johnson, and you've got, I mean, I want to see an action movie. And 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 Black Adam is kind of as from what I've heard the everybody that I've talked to that has seen it has enjoyed it. They don't think it's the best movie ever made, but they had fun, and that's kind of universal. People are like you know what I had fun. I like seeing this. I like it was kick ass action and 
And um, you know, I heard they had I heard they had to kind of tone it down to make it uh, not R rated. I'd love to see an unrated cut of Black Adam. And if anybody can get it done, The Rock can get it done. So I'm looking forward to see a meaty powerhouse of a movie where Dwayne The Rock Johnson's killing some fools. That's what I want to see. So Sergio, hopefully, uh, look, I want it to be successful so they can continue on. Continue on with this universe. And hell, if they're going to make a Black Adam Kingdom Come movie, pfft, come on, I'll bring that on. Hey, our old friend Claudius is here. Hello, Claudius. Monsieur Bonnet. Do remember, you, me, 1983, Hotel <laughs> Hotel Negresco, Duran Duran, Elton John, Russell Mulcahy shooting I'm Still Standing and Endless Martinis. Meanwhile, Chris Claremont writing, Paul Smith penciling, The X-Men. Uh, that would have been 83, so The X-Men would have been like, would that, would that be in like the 160s? X-Men 160s around there? Paul Smith did like the Brood storyline. Was that back in the day? Man, I don't know. I'm old. That was a long time ago. But you know what, Claudius? Those are fun times. Russell Mulcahy directing the I'm Still Standing video. For those of you who don't know, Russell Mulcahy cut his teeth doing music videos in the early 80s, He, um, such as Duran Duran's Rio video. And he, of course, directed Highlander. And one of my favorite seven ripoffs, Resurrection with the Highlander, Christopher Lambert himself. So, yeah, that's a that's a good shout out. Uh, good to see you, Claudius. Hope the fam is doing well. By the way, we are bringing uh, back Whining About Movies. Jason S. says, Rob, at the start of your show, you again forgot to say, I'm the alien prince that never was. It's part of your origin story. Some ideas on that show framed by Rob in 10 minutes framed in 10 minutes what jason s is referring to uh for those of you who don't know i was adopted and um you know as a as a i did not know uh my biological parentage i never even cared i never even um i never even really was interested but i did dream i did think about the fact that when i was a kid that maybe I was an alien prince of some some kind sequestered here on Earth for protection. <laughs> Until from some some rampaging alien hordes, <laughs> you know. Because when you're a kid, why why wouldn't you want to be an alien prince that's in hiding? You know, someone like John Carter. Um, maybe I was transported here and when I when I reached a certain age, a ship would land on my front lawn, kind of like Star Lord, and the re ravagers would come get me or whatever, take me away. Calgon take me away. Um that didn't happen. I did, however, meet my um, my biological mother and my biological sister. I found out I had a 100% biological sister who was 14 months younger than me. And if you look on my channel, uh, I did put, uh, I have a video of our first meeting when I met my biological sister. If you're at all interested, you can delve into that and find out. So there you go. Uh, I've got more Super Chats and tips waiting. Don't worry. Um, I am going to read another article, another letter. This one, uh, comes from John Wallbacker. Uh, Hey Rob, I am writing to you because of a point you made in a recent live stream. You were talking about the expanse and you mentioned how it was diversity done right. And that you'd never heard the producers of the show talk about the diversity. They just did it because it was real. This revealed a really important point about modern discourse and how the outrage mongers use the interview words of cast and producers to stoke unnecessary flames. The reality is that all of these shows talk about things like this in the press. It is typically an interview topic when a show goes in a direction of more diversity. With even the simplest Google searches, I found this one from the exec producers of the show back in 2016. It was one of the things that we talked about early on, says executive producer Naren Shankar, who himself is obviously of Indian descent, one of the three showrunners on The Expanse. He credits authors Daniel Abraham and Ty Frannick, who write together under the pseudonym James S.A. Corey, with the show's broad ethnic mix because it's such a significant part of their books. They always said, the people who make it out into space, it's not going to be Neil Armstrong, clean-cut, classically white Americans. It's going to be Indian, Chinese, Russian people, a mix of everybody, every ethnicity, and it's just going to melt and mingle. We really wanted to reflect that and retain that in the show because it does say something about humanity and that movement out into space. 
Talking about shows through the lens of diversity has been a part of the creation of these shows for a long time. The reason it is a point of topic is because of how much it isn't the norm. This is just a few years ago and you have execs asked and discussing the diversity in their show. No different than how the cast and crew of something like The Rings of Power were asked and answered similar questions about their show. The only difference between the two is the discourse surrounding it. You have only heard about Rings of Power's cast and crew discussing these things because the outrage mongers look for these interviews and amplify these types of quotes to claim that the creative decisions are bankrupt to a political agenda. It isn't an agenda. It is a periphery talking point that the cast and crew might find worth discussing when asked. There's nothing wrong with that, nor is this a new phenomenon. You even have shows like House of the Dragon that write in modern political hot topics into the text of the show. Rampant misogyny, abortion as a major plot point, the power dynamics of women in male-focused systems of power, etc. Yet that show is somehow not being political, while Rings of Power is lambasted for it with almost no modern political ideology in the text of the show, merely mentioned in interviews as something the cast and crew are proud they were able to bring to the screen as part of an otherwise straightforward narrative. The issue that is driving the hate for the show through the vocal outcry of channels doing dozens of vi videos hyper, hyper, hyperbolizing, hyperbolic, hyperbolizing the quality of these shows even months before they are actually released is the same thing that progressive producers have long discussed in interviews that their shows strive to represent. I think it is important to understand the context here. The Expanse producers did openly talk about their diversity and what Rep, what that represented in their show. In fact, there are dozens of articles about authors, cast, and crew discussing the diversity of their show and its importance. No different than how the MCU or the Rings of Power crews have discussed it in their context. The difference is now there are people predisposed to finding a political agenda and using it as jet fuel to discuss politics as a negative in the creative experience of that context. There should be more nuance here, and if a simple Google search reveals much of the same discussion around the expanse, as it does for She-Hulk or Rings of Power, maybe the issue isn't producers talking too much about diversity or a new concept of forcing said diversity into our entertainment. The problem is the people who are currently weaponizing these quotes as ammunition to generate viewership based on knocking content before it's released to generate views and earn money off of social media exposure. I respect your wise and experienced perspective, but it does frustrate me to hear people like you say The Expanse never talked about diversity to suggest that the producers of recent content being attacked are not doing it right, when you can clearly see in recent history neither discuss their shows in the press all that differently. All love and respect, Wally. Wally, what a great letter. Uh, first of all, I appreciate you writing in, but I, I would like to... I would like to... Um, I want to point something out here, and I, I think we're we're these are different things that you're discussing. First of all, when you were talking about the expanse, um, and the quote you gave me, it was one of the things we talked about early on. This is Naren Shankar. Naren uh, Naren uh, is Indian. He worked on Next Generation. Great guy, terrific writer. Uh, he also worked on CSI for years, so he's also rich, rich, rich. Uh, it was one of the things we talked about early on, says executive producer Naren Shankar, one of the three showrunners on The Expanse. With the show's broad ethnic mix because it's such a significant part of their books, they always said the people who make it out into space, it's not just going to be Neil Armstrong. Clean-cut, classically white Americans, it's going to be Indian, Chinese, Russian people, a mix of everybody, every ethnicity. Okay, here's the difference, the way I see it. The Expanse... The diversity in that show was, it was real. Like it was, it was what would happen in humanity's future. When humanity moves out into the stars, we're already seeing it with the privatization of space. And, you know, people don't know, but India has a space program. The, the, the uh, UAE has a probe at Mars. China has probes on the moon and going to Mars. So, the earth, the people of the earth, as we move out into space, will be no longer based. I mean, there's there's only one species of human being on this planet, humanity. There's only one 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 of us with different ethnic makeups, depending basically from geological region where the, the natural order of things when you're where your ancestors were depending. So there's really one group of people. But when we move out into space, like they say, 
the reality is that over the course centuries into the future, we're going to have all different kinds of people moving out into space. I mean, already now, we don't have just Neil Armstrong. I mean, at the beginning of the space program, you just had fighter pilot dudes that were the ones that were tapped. But now with more women, all different kinds of scientists, different people from around the world. So it is a natural thing. The diversity in the expanse is a natural extension of where humanity would be. So the diversity becomes realism. And and that was built into the, the books. And I think what people... Look, we're living in an area... I can tell you right now that I am working in Hollywood being a middle-aged dude, moving out of middle age into just old age like I am. There are people in Hollywood that have no interest in what I am saying as, a, as an older white cis male. Now, I don't have a problem with that. I mean, it just means I have to work harder and do different things to continue to work the way I want to work. I like the idea that we have marginalized voices and people that weren't able to uh, make things getting more opportunities because hopefully it will lead to better stories and I'll get to buy movies of stories that I have yet to hear that haven't been told yet. I mean, I, you know, I go back and I use the example of, uh, and I, I, I've been thinking about it a lot. Spike Lee, his first movie that I saw, I, I believe it's his first feature, was a movie called She's Gotta Have It, uh, about a black woman in Brooklyn, black and white film, multiple boyfriends, and she's gotta have it. The title is what it is. It's, it's, it sums up the film. I had never seen that his voice before. And when I first saw She's Gotta Have It, I was knocked out by it. And then he went on to make School Days, and then he made Do the Right Thing. And Do the Right Thing is a, I think it's a masterpiece. And it's more relevant than ever before. But here's the thing. Spike Lee, however he had, however hard he had to fight to get the money to make that movie, he went out and made the movie. Whatever challenges he made, cha every filmmaker, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, what your sexuality is, what your religious beliefs are. If you want to make a movie, you face the same problems. Anybody can make a film. The technology that exists now, you can buy three iPhone 14s with proper lighting. You can make a film that's almost indistinguishable from a Hollywood production if you have the talent in front of and behind the camera. Making movies is really hard. I think that, that while there are hot button issues, using The Expanse, the reason I love the diversity in The Expanse was it, it added to the verisimilitude of it. I love the casting of The Expanse. I think it's great. You know, and so The Expanse, the diversity was built into the story. And it works. I mean, I would have had it no other way. And plus, if you just watch that show, the spectrum of different kinds of actors that they cast. I mean, I love Bobby. I, I love the fact that she's of Maori descent. I mean, I lived in New Zealand. I There were some beautiful Maori women. I, I loved the way they looked. You know, I'd never, until I lived in New Zealand, I, I mean, I'd been to Hawaii, but I hadn't lived anywhere. I've been, I was in New Zealand on and off for years between um, 2001 and 2005, the beginning of 2005. It was fantastic. And to see, you know, a Maori woman who was Martian, you know, it was great. I loved it. But I do think that, um, I think what people are objecting to is now everything Look, believe it or not, there are quotas now. And does that matter? Not really. But uh, as long as I don't care if a character is a certain color. Like, nobody remembers this. And nobody would care because it wasn't a big deal. And I use this example all the time, too. Uh, one of my favorite stories ever was this Stephen King story, Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption in different seasons. The character of Red was an Irishman in the movie, Frank Darabont cast Morgan Freeman. Well, in the book, the character of Red was a white dude, a white Irish dude with red hair. Why do they call you Red? Maybe it's because I'm Irish. They didn't even change the line. No one, no one on earth, at least no one I knew or ever heard or never read about, nobody ever once objected to the casting of Morgan Freeman in Shawshank Redemption. In fact, I think the people that actually go back and read the story are confused and perplexed because you cannot think about the Shawshank Redemption without thinking about Morgan Freeman and hearing his voice in that role. Nobody said shit because it was great. 
and nobody cared, <laughs> you know, and nor should you, and uh, cast the best actor for the role. But what's happening now is I think that there is a, there is an overcorrection happening in our pop culture that people are objecting to. And they, they, yeah, are they monetizing hate or clicks? Yes. But there is, I mean, come on, you have to admit that in our culture today, there is a, a contingent of very angry, mean people that would like to punish others for the oppression that they've felt for their lives. And, you know, chickens have come home to roost, more power to them. But you can't trade one oppression for another. And um, uh, it, it, it I just think that there's it, there's different ways to look at it. Um, and I think what we want, what I want, is verisimilitude. Give me the reality of uh, something. And cast the best actor for the role, regardless of what color they are. But look, there are instances that we are having to deal with. The Scarlett Johansson was going to be cast as a trans 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 man. And um, in in a in a movie, movie didn't happen because people objected to the fact that Scarlett Johansson's not tr not trans. Well, I, I don't understand when we we now live in a world where actors are supposed to be the people in real life that they are. Like I've never met a vampire, but a lot of actors have played vampires, and I don't recall anybody going, "Hey, man, that person can't play a vampire because they're not a vampire in real life." You know, I mean, th this idea that actors have to be the people in real life, that you can't cast a an actor that's not the real person that they're playing on screen is weird to me. Now, I understand the underlying principle behind that is you want actors who are, whether it's their LGBTQ, whether they're different ethnicities or whatever, you want all those actors to to have a, uh, a chance. And I, I agree with that. But here's another reality. And it's a reality of the business because it ain't show friends and it's not show activism. It is show business. And it's unfortunate that Scarlett Johansson didn't get to play that role because there is no trans actor in Hollywood right now who can, and people would argue with the fact that Scarlett Johansson is a box office draw outside of certain things, but she is a star. And until there is a trans actor who is a big star, and there will be one day, and I welcome that, um, they, you got to get somebody that's going to open your movie that people will pay to go see. And it doesn't matter. I'm just using that as an example. That's true of any movie, especially at the studio level. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, they'll put in, he's a helicopter pilot in San Andreas. You know, he's, he's Humphrey Bogart in The Jungle Cruise. The, people, the reason that Dwayne The Rock Johnson gets cast in all these movies now is because he's a worldwide box office draw. I mean, he can play anything. They'll put him in a movie. And, and the movie will open. That's what happens with these things. And, and unfortunately, uh, what people forget is it doesn't matter who's playing the part. Nobody cares about an actor. Nobody has ever thought to themselves, that I don't believe that actor because they're not that person in real life. No actor is. And so this weird desire amongst activists that only actors, you know what's really unfortunate? When Philadelphia came out, Denzel, Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks played a black, uh, uh, black. he played a white lawyer who was dying of AIDS, a gay man dying of AIDS, and Denzel Washington represented him. And that movie brought a lot of awareness of the AIDS epidemic to people that might not have been sympathetic. And it, it cast on a, on a wide, large canvas a light on what was going on at that time, which was tragic. And I'll tell you something. Do I think that one of the reasons it was able to pass muster because Denzel Washington was cast as the lawyer that represented him? Yes. That was a film where diverse casting actually helped the subject matter at hand because people, <laughs> it was interesting. The people that wanted to hate had different, th I think the hatred canceled out anybody that was prejudicial against gay men, especially gay men afflic afflicted with AIDS. That got canceled out by the fact that Denzel Washington was defending him. So they're, they're, either way, it was a great film. Uh, Tom Hanks won an Academy Award for his performance. But the important thing about that movie was the fact that it shined a light on what was afflicting the gay community at that time. We were over a decade into that horrible plague, and it made everyone sympathetic to the plight of AIDS victims and the LGBTQ community. By activists getting Scarlett Johansson basically thrown out of a role, they denied the story of that individual to be told. 
and it hasn't been told yet. Maybe it'll get told someday. But are we all, are we better off now because somebody objected to the fact that a trans actor was not cast in the role? I think we are diminished as a culture by not have a, having that story told. And for all the people that want to do good for the trans community, it would have been very interesting to have a story about a trans person that was painted in a sympathetic light and played by a major star who fearlessly was going to take on that role. But unfortunately, the activism that happened today prevented that movie from getting made, and that's a damn shame. So I think that's what's happening. There is great activism that's going on, and people are getting great opportunities, but there is also activism that is destroying opportunities that's unfortunate that would help the very communities that our activists come from. And look, again, my position is great stories well told. Anytime a story doesn't get told because somebody says that person's wrong for the role or that person's a different color for the role or whatever, we're all diminished. And that's sort of how I feel about that. But anyway, great letter, Wally. Very much appreciate it. See, this is why I love reading letters. By the way, if you guys want to write me letters, go to the Post Geek Singularity website and you can send them to me. So do that. Post Geek Singularity, it's right down there. PostGeekSingularity.com. Send me a letter. If you want me to read it live on the show, usually I just assume if people write me letters, if you don't want me to write, read it on the show, please just say not for air in the letter. So, um, so there you go. Let's see. A um, bunch of other people firing in more, uh, more tips. Um, so anyway, the Prince that never was Jason S. I never got back to that. Uh, I'm the alien prince that never was. Oh, yeah, I did. I answered that. That's why I, why I came up with that. I didn't just start to talk about me being an alien prince. Darv Thader says, Rob, you are the dopest mofo on the internet. <laughs> Am I? You know what's funny? I'd like to consider myself a dope mofo, but now if I call myself a dope mofo, I say the Duke of Dope Discourse, I'm waiting for someone to say that that's some kind of a cultural appropriation. You know, I mean, I can't even... I can't even talk about um, my hoopty without worrying that somebody gets mad. Uh, but anyway, you're the dopest mofo on the planet. Your commentary is fantastic, and your passion for movies and sci-fi is infectious. Every time I see one of your shows, you make me want to watch films. Oh, and thanks for tuning me in to For All Mankind. Not only, okay, here, here's here's the power of social media, so check this out. This actually is really great. It, if you, I, I sealed this up at the John Campy show, and I had ice, I had a, a, a Diet Coke, icy Diet Coke from, from like Burger King, I poured into here, and it kept the ice all weekend long. Anyway, I got this because I was tweeting about my love for all mankind, just on Twitter, and I got contacted by Sony, Sony, the overall production company, and they said, thank you for your tweets about for all mankind, and they just sent me swag. They sent me this, they sent me a sweatshirt. Hey, Power of the internet. Love this show. So, Darth Vader, thank you. I'm glad you. I make you want to watch films. Look, I do believe films are the greatest storytelling medium uh, humanity has ever come up with. Although I wonder, I've said this before, I think we're living in the post-cinema age. The new generation coming up. Everyone likes cinema, but you know now it's it's people are allowed with technology to star in their own TikTok videos, their own reels, and things like that. I think... The younger generation is less interested in movies. Um, I am not. I will go to my grave loving, loving, loving movies. So, but I'm glad you like them. Uh, Maximus, uh, the flip, the Maximus is the evil alter ego of Claudius. Uh, Maximus says, Robithan, the Robinator. Bruh, long time since you've had the pleasure of reading my words. Snyderverse, bruh. Cue the nature boy. Woo! The Snyder versus frickin' epic of Gilgamesh scored by Wagner, performed in La Scalia. La Scala, actually. Uh, so La Scalia, dude. That's right. That's exactly right, Maximus. People know I started a whole late night show, Midnight Metal, because of the Snyder verse, bruh. And you know what? That's why we love it. I mean, people, who doesn't love the Molly Hatchet Death Dealer cover? And I think that there that that's that's just what I'm saying. I mean, listen, just you listen to Wagner. Go listen to Goethe Damerung. You'll be like, oh yeah, they use that music in Excalibur. Just listen to it. You know, you'll you'll you're like, oh, 
you know, Wagner's opera, Goethe Dammerung, the well, what's well, Tristan was it Tristan Isolde, Goethe Dammerung, Das Rheingold, um, uh, just 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 the ri- ring of the Nibelung, you know, you'll f- be like, oh, Tolkien, yeah, I get it. Listen to that music, man. You'll you'll think Zack Snyder's Justice League. I'm telling you, you will think that because that's where it came from. I mean, that's where it all it all comes from Faulkner. Um, uh, let's see, let's see. A lot of people have been sending in more uh, super chats. Um, Tony uh, Trombetta says, "Rob, do you believe that Superman Returns should have had a sequel? Yes. And do you believe Singer would have made a better movie the second time around? I think so." I mean, I really like. Look, I, 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 I was talking to Brian recently because there's plans afoot to do like another 4K Superman box set or something. I mean, maybe I don't know. And um, I think that there's actually what's called the Friends and Family version of Superman Returns is a is a is a better movie. It's about 30 minutes longer. And when Brian showed the movie to people, a lot of especially younger people did not understand the first 20 minutes when Superman went back to Krypton and you saw. The shattered Krypton because they didn't know they hadn't seen the Donner Superman, and there was like the first twenty minutes was was no dialogue. It was all it was very it was very Terrence Malick, it was very uh, Tarkovsky. Um, but I was saying, you know, th- that must exist. The tape it was an avid output, but wouldn't it be cool if they put that out and you could see that version of Superman Returns? But yeah, there was. Look, I I had pitched Brian when Superman Returns had come out. Um. I had an idea about Brainiac. Uh, it was a long con. Maybe one day I've talked about it on previous shows, but but it's it's kind of a long convoluted idea. But um, I liked it. <laughs> I thought it would have been good. Uh, I had it very well thought out. So um, basically, Brainiac. For th- there's a lot of stuff going on. It I, people haven't seen Superman Returns. It's really tied into Superman Returns. But Brainiac comes to Earth drawn by new krypton as like a beacon the power of new krypton uh brainiac at the beginning of the movie you would see uh brainiac is an ai the kryptonian ai that all the 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 knowledge of all the 28 known galaxies is curated by brainiac i was kind of taking cues from superman the animated series and brainiac is this ai that also knows that krypton is going to explode and the Kryptonian elders come and consult Brainiac, um, and Brainiac would be a you know a humanoid. And when you see, you'd see the beginning of Superman the movie, and you'd see Superman's ship Kal El blasting off. But before Krypton explodes, you would see another ship rise up and leave, and it is Brainiac and the entire Kryptonian library of all the twenty-eight known galaxies in a ship, and 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 he leaves. And um, he doesn't know about Jor-El's plans, and he doesn't know that Earth exists. So what Brainiac has been doing for thousands of years, because Superman was actually launched to Earth, basically it took a long time for him to get there. So Brainiac, uh, what Brainiac is doing is Brainiac, the one thing he can't have, is like many AIs, is to be alive. He wants to know what it is to live, to be alive. And so he has been going to from planet to planet and getting everything they know, kind of like the Borg, assimilating planets. And he experiments by taking their forms and making bodies for himself, cloning bodies, kind of like an avatar, and putting his essence into them. But the bodies all burn out. And then uh, it doesn't work. He, he, he can't, he, he doesn't get to stay alive for very long. But he does have, he's figured out a way to take certain forms. And eventually, with, with the beacon of New Krypton, he comes to Earth, and he comes down to Earth in the form of, of of Superman, like a human being, a Kryptonian. But what he ends up doing is ingratiating himself to the world by, unlike Kal-El, is he starts giving the world things it needs, our planet, a cure for cancer. He stops, like there'd be a scene where in the Middle East there's going to be like Kuwait's being invaded. Brainiac shows up, but no one knows it's Brainiac, and stops a war. But just kills a bunch of people, kills the invading army, and Superman says, you can't do that. And eventually, a rift happens, and then, of course, Brainiac, what Brainiac wants is Superman's son, because he sees Superman's son as being the the body that will, with the yellow sun, he will be able to live on in the body of this of this kid. It goes from there, and it becomes Mordred. It's a long story, but that's the gist. It goes from there, and 
The world loves Brainiac, and Brainiac is able to depose Superman because Brainiac helps the world, and Superman hasn't been. And everyone's like, "Why haven't you been helping us? If you have the technology to cure cancer, why don't you have? Why haven't you done it?" Well, because Jor-El said, "Don't do that, because you'll st- you'll fuck up the planet." Uh, but anyway, never got made. Too bad. What are you gonna do? Woulda, coulda, shoulda. Shy Potsy says, "Sorry, Rob. Last one. The MCU Civil War Two. What do you think that could look like?" Well, you know, that's interesting. I mean, obviously, Captain Marvel is a big player in Civil War II in the comics. I I don't know yet where the MCU is going. I don't think we know enough to know where Civil War II would be headed. I need to see what happens with Captain America, New World Order. Um, I will say this. I have read all six scripts for Secret Invasion. I really liked them. I hope they, I hope it's, it's, it's much more, it's, it's like Falcon and Winter Soldier in the sense that it's globe trotting, it's espionage, spy thriller, alien infiltration. Uh, it's really, really good. And I really, really liked it. As a matter of fact, if they stick the landing with this, it'll easily be my favorite. I don't know if it's still considered, because Wakanda Forever is supposed to be the end of phase four from what I understand. Uh, Secret Invasion was great, though. Really, really great. Although you're going to cry at the end of episode one. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I can say. People are already, like, demonetized. Click. Um, so I don't know what that would look like, but who knows? Rampage Predacon says, Hi, Rob. Why was the Snyder cut a six-hour movie? Was it initially supposed to be a two-part Justice League film, and why was the film not widescreen format? Well, uh, they wanted to go with this IMAX square format. Look, you know, that's kind of a sticking point with me. Great looking Blu-ray. I wouldn't have done that. I mean, in IMAX, it makes sense. I would have have gone for for either the IMAX ratio of what, basically 166, um, because it's cool. I mean, I like those visuals. I think that, I think that... um, if he had made that as a regular film, he probably would have would have cut it down more. There's a lot of overindulgence in the editing. You could cut that movie down, but I think that being he was supposed to make a second part of that Justice League movie, but I think what he did was you know, in a way it's the purest form of what he wanted to do. He gave us his opera, his superhero opera. And it is it's it's on a grand scale and it has a different feel to it. And I remember just just being enchanted by it. <laughs> honest I mean when I was a kid I hate like the Justice League was my favorite superhero team when I was a kid until I met the new Teen Titans and the X-Men I love the Justice League I love the Justice League the the Justice League version Joss Whedon's version I I hated it so much because I like the characters I like Ben Affleck as Batman I like Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman you know the, the problem with with Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice is it's such a slog I mean, I liked a lot of it, but I mean, why do you have to? Why did you have to put in the death of Superman in there, Doomsday, and all this? It's like it was so dark and oppressive. There was nothing joyous. There was no fun in that movie. And I do like the the uh, Ultimate Edition better. But why is Gotham City across the bay from Metropolis? What Superman had never flown over? There's a lot of things in Dawn of Justice that are just goofy that I just don't buy, and that bum me out. But but the Snyder Cut isn't six hours. It's like four and a half hours or something. I like it. <laughs> um, Beyond Comics 2019. Hassoni from Sweden. Our friend Hassoni sends in a super chat and says, congrats to 50,000. Yeah, I'm about to get 50,000 subscribers. Uh, I should have been there a lot sooner, but I this year is I, I, I have been seriously curtailed because of the John Campy show. I'm trying to do more. I think I've done more observations in October than I've done for the last eight previous eight months and I'm going to continue doing it because I like seeing those subscribers go up. And I really want to get – look, I don't get one of those nifty YouTube plaques that you get to 100,000 subscribers. I mean, Dan Merle started his own channel and rocketed to 100,000 subscribers. If I did short videos, I could do that. But anyway, Video Hunter D says, need Dave for Halloween and a Hellraiser discussion. Ooh, I would like to um, – I would like to – I would like to uh, do that with Dave. I love doing Halloween themed things with Dave, and we haven't talked about Hellraiser. I'd like to have my friend Connie uh, Connie Sang come on. She loves Hellraiser. Turned her on to Hellraiser. She's been watching it, and uh, we went and saw Hellraiser one and two together. Film prints last month. It was great. 
part of Beyond Fest. Uh, so maybe that'll happen. I'll ask Dave, see what's up. Sam Phillips says, Robert, who would you say are some of your top picks to direct Man of Steel 2? There's only one person I want to direct Man of Steel 2. Superman, whatever you call it. Chris McQuarrie. I want him to write and direct the script. You know, I saw a clip where he's talking about how no one asked him. He already worked with Henry Cavill. You know, the, the cocking of the arms, the ch -ch -ch. I want to see Superman do that shit. I want that to be a signature move, and I want to see him do that before flying into Black Adam, whatever that's going to be. Uh, if Chris McCory wrote and directed a Superman movie, I think it could be one of the best superhero movies ever made. I honestly believe that. Uh, and I know Chris McCory a little bit, not much, but I haven't seen him in a long time. I haven't seen him in, what, 15 years or something, but I really like Chris McCory, and um, I hope he can do it. I think it'd be great. He's my only pick. There aren't a lot of, I'm sorry, there aren't a lot of directors around that can handle a major motion picture, a studio temple property. We don't have many directors that have proven themselves. You know, the other person I could say would do it that I think could make a great movie is, of course, James Mangold. I think Mangold could do it. Um, I think so. Hitchcock the Goat says, always love your insights, Rob. Glad I was able to catch you live. Well, good to see Hitchcock's the Goat. I place House House of the Dragon amongst the best three or four seasons of Game of Thrones. Oh, I'm right there with you. You know, there's something about the game of this season of Game of Thrones. It's a little, I think it's fantastic, um, and the fact that it's it's much more focused than Game of Thrones. I mean, Game of Thrones was Game of Thrones is much more sprawling, um, but I do think I do. This is kind of a this is this is going to seem weird to people. It's going to seem really weird. You're right. House of the Dragon is great. But <laughs> I see House of the Dragon. I don't know why. Why the, I have not spoken this aloud, I don't think. But I'm going to say this, and if you think I'm strange for saying this, House of the Dragon is to Game of Thrones what Rocky Three is to the Rocky franchise. <laughs> I mean... I love, who doesn't love Rocky Three? Rocky Three is so, so, so enjoyable. You know, you've you've got Hulk Hogan, you've got Clubber Lang, you've got Mr. T as Clubber Lang. Everything in Rocky Three is great. You have Apollo Creed. I mean, it's so much fun to watch. But it couldn't exist without Rocky One and Two. Like House of the Dragon, it already had all the world building done, so it just becomes, deli it's all the great deliciousness, the scheming and the fighting and the dragons and all that. Because it didn't have to build the world of Westeros. Whereas Rocky One and Rocky Two, hey man, I'm a Rocky Two. I don't, I don't think I have to be an apologist. I think Rocky Two is a great fucking sequel. I think I, I do. But Rocky Three was just way fun. Um, like House of the Dragon is. House of the Dragon is just delicious fun. It's it's a soap opera. It is. It's like a, it's 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 a total soap opera, and it's a great soap opera, and I love it. I love it. But you're right. It's right up there. House of the Dragon is one of the great. It's it's clearly one of the best prequels ever made. Clearly. So, um, uh, Sam Phillips says, "Are you happy or sad? Superman Lives didn't get made. That would I was in. John Schnett made the documentary, The Death of Superman Lives. What happened? Late great John Schnett that I'm actually in. Although I wouldn't have worn shorts to interview if I know you would have seen them. Um, I." Do I, you know, it probably, look, would I watch that movie now? <laughs> yes. Do I wish it got made? Yes. I think it would have been batshit insane. I don't know if it would have been good, but it certainly would have been crazy. It would have been like the Jodorowsky's Dune. That also didn't get made. But it would be the Jodorowsky's Dune of Superman mo movies if it got made. And if you haven't seen the documentary Jodorowsky's Dune, um... Alejandro Jodorowsky is a filmmaker that made movies like El Topo, uh, Santa Sangre, which is a great movie too, by the way, if you haven't seen it, The Holy Mountain. He is crazy, but awesome. He's also a comic book writer. He wrote The Inkle that Mobius uh, illustrated. Um, but he was going to make Dune in the 70s and didn't get to make it. But there's a great documentary about that. So it was it was great. So am I happy or sad? I'm, I'm, you know what? I'd much rather something gets made than not get made. I'd much rather live in a world where things get made because that would be better. Uh, Fate Dream Logic just sent in uh, support. Thank you for Fate Fate Dream Logic. I love that. Fate Dream Logic. Thanks for the support. Appreciate it. GM says, why are studios so hesitant to do rich plots like this? 
I want juicy things like the Brainiac plot on the big screen. GM, I'm right there with you, but here's the thing. The reality is it is much harder to translate something to the big screen and make it work than you might think. Because while we, remember, we all know, we're all steeped in comic book lore, we know all of these things, the general audience and the audience around the world is not. So, how do you tell the story? How You have to establish who these characters are first before you can uh, tell a story. And it's really hard. It's really hard to do that. And with Superman, it's doubly hard because you have to make somebody, just like You'll Believe a Man Can Fly in the first Superman movie, Superman the movie that Richard Donner directed, you have to believe in these villains. You have to believe in these characters. I mean, that's why they brought back Zod for Zack Snyder's Justice League, or Zack Snyder's Man of Steel, because who do you have Superman fight? How do you create a credible threat for Superman that you can pit him against? I mean, the biggest problem everyone had with Superman too, well, they had two, pro uh, Superman Returns probably, pardon me, I can't even speak, is the fact that he was a super stalker, people didn't like that, and he didn't fight anybody. You know, he picked up a big rock, and, and it was a much more existential Superman movie, but and I think it's aged well, and Brandon was great in the role, but I, um, people want to see Superman fight somebody, and the thing that I'm really excited about about Black Adam and the reason I wanted to succeed is because I want Black Adam. At, he is a formidable foe and friend to Superman, and I think you can make a really compelling movie with the two of them, and I'd love to see it. I'd love to see it get made. So. Yeah. Um, so it's hard. It's really hard to do that. It's really hard to do Brainiac. Um, and the problem is, like, with me, look, when studios are spending $200 million, they have to be able to have the people that they can bet on to make these movies. And there are very few few of them on the planet Earth. I would say, I used to say that there's, like, 20 directors that studios want to make tentpole movies. I think that's down to about 10 there's 10 people on the planet Earth that a studio would give $200 million to, some, to, to make a movie. Only that. And um, there's not a lot of them. Uh, really Not That Funny sends in a super chat and says, this is not funny. You're right. Really Not That Funny says, who is a scroll, Rob? Who is a scroll? Well, I'll tell you. Talos. Talos is a scroll. Ben Mendelsohn's a scroll. That's all I'm going to say. What? Come on. Come on, man. You think I'm going to tell you who a scroll is? Ben Mendelsohn, Talos is a scroll. Since you asked the question, I answered it. I appreciate the support. That's all you're getting from me. Uh, Charlie Rogers, NBN, is a member for four months. Thanks for the support. I appreciate that. Tom Jr. Jackson, who coined the phrase, we are all goof people. And truly, we are. He's been a member for 25 months. Tom Jr. Jackson, who is also a moderator here, says, Rob, great show. And also, we must figure out a day and time to talk, sir. We are all goof people. Indeed, we are. Uh, Binary Sunset Media sends in a $20 super chat. Thank you for that. Uh, Binary uh, Sunset Media says, McCory is perfect. When asked about his approach to Top Gun, he said, I wanted to make a sincere film, and that's why people loved it. I want a sincere Superman film, no meta. Look, if somebody even said to me, if if, if I could make a, any Superman movie, I would make a super a Superman for all seasons, and do sp and have t title card headings: spring, summer, winter, fall. I, I would do that. I would make a lyrical movie, and you know what? I'd I'd probably go get Frank Darabont and drag him out of retirement. The man who made the Green Mile, and the man who made Shawshank Redemption, and the Mist. And the majest, not yeah, Matt, no, the majestic, right? I would bring him out of retirement. I think Frank Darabont, that would be somebody else, you know, for all the hell he's been put through with his Walking Dead lawsuit and all that. I would go get Frank Darabont and tell him that he should write and direct a Superman movie. Absolutely, hundred uh, percent. I love Frank Darabont, but Chris McQuarrie. Um. Uh. <laughs> uh. Josiah Savedra Sev says, Hey, Rob, have you tried a Joker impression? I heard your laugh, and it reminded me of Troy Baker or Mark Hamill. Peace out, bro. I've never tried a Joker impression. I'd love to, I mean, I, other than the schemers, planers, uh, other than the Joker. 
uh, the Keith Ledger Joker. But I, you know, I don't. I'm not an actor, but um, I play one on our John Campia short videos. So I, I, uh, <laughs> a Joker laugh. <laughs> something like that i don't know <coughs> i'd have to think about it <laughs> and I, as i'm coughing mm. aaron singh says cavill superman needs a scene like the plane rescue from returns i i agree that was one of the most perfect superman rescues totally liked it the only thing though i wish the effects were a little better there's some effects in that that i don't dig i probably should um by the way i'm it is sober October, so I am drinking water. Uh, our friend RRTNZ, Glenmark, all the way from New Zealand. Uh, Hail Rob, as a Superman fan since 1978, I enjoyed Man of Steel. In my humble opinion, we need to see Soup's take on Brainiac. There's so many great stories to adapt. I agree. I agree. Totally agree. Um... So thanks for that. And I guess I'll see you. By the way, for those of the people who are members of the channel, we do bi-weekly. Or that's, we want it bi-weekly. We are doing a member chat this Saturday for you members. They're all fun. You know, we usually hang out for a number of hours, three or four hours usually, and just shoot the shit, which is always fun. Douglas Nelson says, House of the Dragon is Dallas with dragons, but it works. Do you think an approach like that would work for a New God series? Hell Yes. I mean, look, the, the, here's the problem that, that I think the biggest problem in Hollywood is that it is very difficult to your, the people that are the gatekeepers in Hollywood. And I don't mean like fan gatekeepers. I mean, literal gatekeepers, keep people that keep you, prevent you from getting somewhere, getting to make what it is that you want. Again, there are very few people on the planet earth that would know how to make a new God's movie. But the problem is, even if you found the perfect person to do it, if Martin Scorsese himself wanted to make a new God's movie, and I love that, that House of the Dragon is Dallas with dragons. Absolutely. But that's why soap operas are some great storytelling. You can get absorbed in, in them. I remember when I was watching General Hospital in the mid-80s. This was after Luke and Laura. This was like Sean Donnelly and Anna Devane and Robert Scorpio, who are like still on the show 40 years later. But But I love that. Because it was, you know, it was like a long spy thriller. But if you had somebody, you have to get past gatekeepers. They're, 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 now they're looking at analytics. They're like, could this movie make any money? Who are we going to put in it? Um, these movies cost so much money now. Unless you can prove that they're, they're as, as risk averse as you can possibly make them. They'll never get made. And, and going to a studio going, I mean, Anna DuVernay was going to make a new God's film. She was working on developing a new God's movie. Not happening. Um, probably because somebody saw a wrinkle in time and I have a crush on her, <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, it, it would be really hard. I'd love to see new God's made that way, but you'd have to convince people like people look at new God's. They look at Orion. They look at like, if you had the black racer, wait a minute, you have a character that like is death on skis flying through space. What? I can only imagine the people, the studios, the Ivy League educated business people. I mean, the crazy thing is, is I've said this a million times, is the executives that run studios are all Ivy League at Princeton, Yale, Stanford, whatever. They're Ivy League educated, master's degree business people that get into Hollywood because the studios are owned by larger corporations and corporations want executives to have certain credentials. Hey, business degree from Harvard or Princeton or Yale. That makes you hireable at the studio level. Does that make you a great studio executive? Do you even know who the new gods are? Well, you've got to find out, but you don't have an affinity. The funny thing is, is all the people that really want to make stories, that passionately want to make stories, are trying to get their stories made with people that don't know the stories. I mean, you can find somebody, I, I still think one of the great executives of all time, and not just because I had a crush on her and knew her, she gave me the time of day. She had. She was hugely in, influential on me. It was Lisa Hansen, or is Lisa Hansen? I mean, thirty years ago, I worked at Warner Brothers, and I was in her office every night, and she listened to me talk and spew my twenty-two-year-old gobbledygook in her office. She went, to, I believe, Yale and 
graduated in, with a degree in comparative mythologies in her in her office at Warner Brothers. It was just a wall of comic books. I mean, I remember one day she uh, Howard Chaykin came in and pitched her a Grimjack series, Timothy Truman's Grimjack series. She didn't know Grimjack, but I mean, she was Jim Henson's daughter, so it wasn't like she was kind of a geek, and it was it was amazing. So, yeah. Um, what can you do? <laughs> um, but it's tough. It's hard to get these movies, movies made, but I like that new gods. Yeah, probably it would, it would probably work. That approach might very well work. Superhero display sends in a tip and says Snyder's Superman being a hero for this time by having that ending shows what real life heroes face when an impossible choice is presented. You choose the lesser of two evils. I agree. I totally agree with that. I, I think that is a, a great example. I mean, in this world, there are no such things as a Superman that's going to have to, well, I'm going to rescue all the people from collateral damage. It, it would be impossible. If, if you're being thrown through buildings in a metropolitan area, how many people are going to die? A lot. And there's nothing Superman could do about it. The idea that you have this perfect Superman who's going to prevent everybody from dying is is silly. Can't do it. Uh, Maximus comes back and says, bruh, why are Twitter Nazi dragging politics into my sci-fi fantasy? Game of Thrones was inspired by the War of the Roses, not contemporary politics, bruh. Henry VIII had nothing to do with religion or feminism, but come on, House the Dragon, can I get some tiggle, <laughs> tiggle bitties? <laughs> that was bad. That was bad, Maximus. I was, I was, I was doing a bad job channeling you. Uh, well, they bring the filthy. They bring the filthy. <laughs> swack props, my man. Swack props. You gotta follow Swack props. Go to first of all, Swack props, Cal. You gotta go. Go to Swack props' Etsy store, and um, he makes. Uh, you know, I don't have it in uh, within. Uh, I I gotta put it back. I gotta put his bag of goodies he sent me within reach. I got his Rorschach diary over there. I got the Nine Gates over there. Swack props makes. He makes paper uh props <laughs> like he will make you the map to the misty mountains it'll look exactly like it looks in lord of the rings and the hobbit and if you shine black light on it the runes appear swack props is a fucking genius he also has very funny memes now i don't know if the memes that he posts on the post geek singularity facebook page are memes he makes or memes he finds but his meme game is strong Swack props has good memes, and I always retreat, we, re, retweet them or put them on Instagram. But giving Cal Swack props full credit, by the way, it's always good for him. If you steal someone's meme, give him a hat tip. Give him a hat tip. I have I haven't always done it, but but you should. Uh, Swack props says I'm just wondering what's the status of Abram's deal at Warner Brothers now that David Zaslav is pulling the strings. I'm sure he'd want to dip his hands into Man of Steel too. He's looking for more franchises to decimate. Oh, I think. I look. Zack Snyder's Madame X film was canceled. Uh, if that was going to be a Zatanna movie, his Superman, he was going to make the Black Superman movie, whether it was Val Zod with Michael B. Jordan or whatever, which I would like to see. I mean, if you're going to make a Black Superman, come on, uh, Michael B. Jordan should be that Black Superman. Although Jonathan Mayers, if you haven't seen the Creed three, I mean, I got to tell you, <laughs> I think that idea for Creed three. That it's a, a childhood friend of Adonis who went to who went to the pokey for 18 years or whatever. I think that's a great idea. And my God, my God, do they look ferocious? I can't wait to see that fight. And I'm curious to see Michael B. Jordan worked has worked with a lot of great directors. He's he's spent he's been in the business for almost 20 years. I mean, if you remember him from The Wire, he died unfortunately. Friday Night Lights, he's worked his way up. You know, he he kind of had a, a an apprenticeship working under. Ryan Coogler, they did Fruitvale Station. They obviously did uh, Creed, Black Panther together. I'm excited. Creed 3 looks pretty damn good. So I'm in. Count me in. But um, in terms of J.J. Abrams' deal, I think, look, they had a $500 million deal. Uh, David Zaslav wanted to cut $3 billion. I think it was a no-brainer. I think J.J. Abrams should have, he should have had something. This is the problem with Hollywood, too. J.J. Abrams should have had something, as soon as that deal was made, he should have put something into production, some big franchise movie. But I really do think that uh, Bad Robot is better on TV than it is in the movies. He's made five science fiction movies, of which I didn't like any of them. The Star Trek movies I couldn't stand. 
I hated Super 8, which was a bad Spielberg homage that even had the wrong anamorphic lens flares on it. And I really hated his two Star Wars movies. So, um, yeah. Uh, but I think his deal is dead, dead, dead. But I don't know for a fact. <coughs> Swack props. So that's that. But I don't know. I don't think he's going to have many more franchises to decimate. Hopefully not. John Suntress says... Uh, John Suntress says, hey, buddy, can't bring myself to watch the Rocky Ford director's cut. Have you? Sounds like they left out the Polly and the robot scenes. I'm psyched for Creed 3. Let's chat soon. They did. Uh, for those of you in the know, Sylvester Stallone did release a director's cut of Rocky 4, where he went back into the Edipe. And yes, the robot that everyone hated is out of the film. But there's things I didn't like about it. I, You know what? It's not very refined. It's a little choppy. I was, to be honest, I was a little disappointed in both uh, the director's cut, Rocky Four director's cut, and uh, the Godfather Coda, the death of Michael Corleone. I still like the extended version the best of that movie. Although I kind of like the beginning, the whole beginning with um, with. Uh, the, the Vatican banker, because I always liked that guy, and that's how the movie starts, and I think that scene's pretty good. I think they did a pretty good job with it. Um, Claudius. Claudius is sending in tips and super chats. Claudius says, My guess, Secret Invasion introduces Sharon Carter by playing Fleetwood Mac's Little Lies because she's a Skrull. I don't know. I don't know if Sharon, Skull, uh, Sharon Carter's a Skrull, and if I did, I wouldn't tell you. So I'll leave that to you. Norwegian Kryptonian says, are critics judging DC movies harder than MCU movies or is that just imagination shine on? No, I'll tell you I'll tell you what I think. The Mar here. The reason the MCU is so beloved, go back and watch cuz I find this I I watched Iron Man 1 again. Everything that you need to know about the success of the MCU is in Iron Man 1. Iron Man 1 is wildly entertaining. It's also very fun. It is a fun movie, but at its core, you laugh in it. I mean, it does everything that a popcorn tentpole movie should do. It has a little bit of romance. Uh, it's fun. It's got camaraderie with him and Rhodey. It's a great superhero story, but at its core, Iron Man 1 is about the story of Tony Stark basically discovering his own conscience and dealing with it. It's not about the apocalypse. It's not about Thanos snapping half the universe away. It's about one man confronting his own conscience about what he's doing, and he has to make a change in his life. And he ends up fighting Obadiah Stane. Understand that. But it's um, it's actually a great film, and it's also very it's very entertaining. And uh, the DCEU, the characters, the heroes, because they're gods, they're a little bit more removed from humanity. I mean, Wonder Woman... Wonder Woman has a lot of the first Wonder Woman has that entertainment, and especially the extended version. I don't know if there there if it's there is there an extended version or am I just thinking about the deleted scenes? But it's it's a uh, it's a good film, and I think that's the problem with DC movies is when you're dealing with Black Adam, a guy who's five thousand years old, he's not a human being. Iron Man's a dude, you know. You would hang out with Tony Stark throwing gang signs in the back of a Humvee. Um, he he's a and so is Steve Rogers, and they're introduced as being down to earth people. Even Thor was literally brought down to earth in the first Thor. So you are endeared to these people because they seem much more well like people than say Superman is. Um, and I think that's why the Marvel movies are the MCU films, the first twenty two at least twenty three if you include Far From Home, are so wildly entertaining. Because those characters are relatable. Like, I'm never going to meet a Superman. I'm never going to meet an alien from Krypton. I'm never going to meet an Amazonian. You know, maybe I'll meet a Batman one day. Still hoping. I'm never going to meet Aquaman. But I could meet someone like Captain America. Sort of. And they've humanized those characters. The heroes are much more human in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And I think that's why they work. So that's why I think they get judged harsher. Um... So let's see. You know what? I think I'll read one. Let, let me find one more letter. I'll end. You can fire in some super chats or tips if you want, and I'll get to them. But 
I think I'm going to read one more letter because it's from David Miller, our friend, longtime friend of the channel, and he's written a letter about Star Trek Lower Decks. It's a Star Trek letter. How can I not read this? Again, from David Miller. Hi, Rob. Long time, no righty. I'm just going to get into it. I'm writing to explain how to fix Star Trek Lower Decks, or rather, how I would prefer to see a comedy show work in a Star Trek setting. First, I want to explain why Lower Decks doesn't work for me. Ooh, I know, Dave. David, you and I park our shuttlecrafts in the same shuttle bay, so I can't wait for this. At its core... At its at its core, I find Star Trek Lower Decks to be a very schizophrenic show in that we have a group of people who are so impulsive and immature that I can't ever see them getting a commission aboard a Starfleet vessel. Yet, when the chips are down and the ship is in danger, they somehow pull it together and become incredibly competent and effective crewmen, even more so than the officers that outrank them, which... I just can't see happening in any real life scenario. This dynamic is directed by the identity on which the show is founded. Lower Decks has elected to embrace buffoonery as their identity, not wit, not cleverness. In the 1970s, the crew of the Cerritos would have been described as a bunch of madcap zanies, similar to the antics of Police Academy. That format has no place in a Star Trek series, in my opinion. So, what is the flip side to buffoonery? Lower Decks should not be Police Academy. It should be MASH, another great comedy of the 70s, but one with a very serious cast of characters, which makes perfect sense. The most intelligent people in a group are often the funniest, and vice versa. As with Star Trek, MASH's cast would often find themselves in the most dangerous of situations where they had to stay professional. They have a job to do, and if they don't do it, people die. The officers of the 4077th would use humor to deal with the horrors and absurdities of war and allow them to make some very profound statements about it along the way. Likewise, the cast of Lower Decks should use humor to help cope with the dangerous conditions they encounter in space an environment tailor-made to kill them, but not create those conditions. Their observations should be humorous, but not farcical. It can be done, people. It can be done. So looking over what I just wrote about a 30-minute situation comedy based on a sci-fi adventure show, I'm the first to admit I may have thought a little too much about this. And full disclosure, I've come to enjoy watching Star Trek Lower Decks, Maybe there isn't enough of an audience anymore for a dry, witty, intellectual comedy, but I sure would like to see what one would look like. Cheers, David Miller. David, uh, first of all, that was a great letter. And second of all, you pretty much just put into uh, uh, stark relief why I don't like the show. Buffoonery. Farce. I don't like that in Star Trek. You know, to me... If you go back and you look, there's basically two overtly, actually a third episode I would include in this. There are three comedic episodes or three episodes that lean on comedy. One of them is not so comedic uh, of the original Star Trek. The first, the obvious one is The Trouble with Tribbles, but one that gets forget forgotten a lot that's equally funny is A Piece of the Action. In A Piece of the Action, uh, Sigma Iosha, the inhabitants of Sigma Iosha, have taken to heart a book that was left behind by an Earthship the Horizon, on their planet 100 years ago, and that book was Chicago Mobs of the 20s. And it's explained that the Iotians are a very imitative people, and they basically wrap their whole society, they design their whole society around Chicago Mobs of the 20s. Which, by the way, is an absurd idea, but it works, and that shows you what Star Trek did well. But all the humor is not at the expense of the characters, and they're not buffoons. Kirk and Spock are still capable. They're still able to do things like get one over on when they're when they're when someone puts the bag on Kirk and Spock, they're able to turn the tables on their captors using well both wit and humor, but also cunning and intelligence. Star Trek was never it never gave you there was never a laugh at the expense of the characters. 
And you just nailed for me, David, why I am not a fan of Lower Decks. I enjoy watching it, but to me, it doesn't, it's the wrong kind of humor. You just, I have to say, I've never heard anybody equate a humorous Star Trek take with MASH. I think that's genius. Problem is, no one remembers MASH anymore. We live in an era where great humor and intelligence in in comedy has been replaced by snark. You know, the thing about um, MASH is that those characters really respected one another. The same could be, be true of Star Trek. And look, I appreciate what Mike McMahon has done with Lower Decks, but even reading, Mike McMahon is a guy, and this I think is true of a lot of people who are in comedy. <clears throat> They're not inside Star Trek. They're outside Star Trek. And I've said this before, but what that means, what do I mean by that? Is, <clears throat> and this is true, by the way, of the people that make Star Trek, uh, um, Strange New World, Star Trek Discovery, and Picard, with, with the exception of Terry Metalis. They're outside of Star Trek. The, peop the problem with modern Star Trek, beginning with J.J. Abrams, is all the people that are making Star Trek now are trying to turn Star Trek into something else. They think Star Trek is either silly, quaint, that they can come in and modernize it and change it. And so, for me, that's why Star Trek hasn't worked. Modern Star Trek is trying to make Star Trek something it isn't, rather than something embracing what it is and moving forward with it. Star Trek 09, J.J. Abrams tried to bring Star Wars and put it in Star Trek, and it's absurd. There's so many things in that movie that have just come off as being stupid. The villain... For instance, dumb villain, I've talked about it. Breaking the fourth wall with Chekhov, another thing. Using the transporter the way the transporter is used. None of it's taken seriously. There is no effort to make Star Trek 09 believable within the context of the Star Trek universe. But even Mike McMahon, who clearly loves Star Trek, he loves it in a postmodern way. And I use the Mugatu as an example that he's brought up. The Mugatu is a white ape costume that they stuck a horn on it and they use it as a monster, uh, a wild animal that attacks Kirk in a second season Star Trek episode called A Private Little War, and it almost kills him. The way it's presented is it first seems a little goofy, but from a production standpoint, they needed a monster. They probably had an ape suit in the studio. They went and got it. They put a horn on it. They made it formidable and made it work. We, however, looking back from 2022 or earlier, can laugh at it, laugh at the what they did to solve that production issue. Or when Spock smiles in the cage, a.k.a. the menagerie, they have based Ethan Peck's entire character of Spock on the fact that as a production gaffe, Spock smiles in an episode, and they've turned that smile. Look, Star Trek was in its prototype phase when they made the cage. That, that was a, a rejected pilot, by the way, so they shouldn't use anything in the cage as canon while the smile was presented in the menagerie. Still, we all know that Spock hadn't been defined yet, and yet Ethan Peck's entire character of Spock was drawn around the fact that that one fucking smile in the cage is, oh, Ethan Peck is not fully formed. The character of Spock has been misunderstood by everyone working on modern Star Trek. No one has got it right. No, Not, not Zachary Quinto, not Ethan Peck. No one has got modern Spock right, and the writers haven't got modern Spock right. They don't get it. They don't get it. And they're looking for things that they can saddle Spock with. It drives me crazy. But even Mike McMahon, he'd rather look at the Mugatu as a goofy thing rather than accept it as an in-universe thing and not make fun of it. And by making fun, by making fun of actual production issues, what you're doing is you're always staying out of Star Trek. You're looking at it from afar. You're never in. You're not buying into the believability of the universe. And what you're doing is you're deconstructing it simply through comedy. I fucking hate that. Anyway, that's just me, just editorializing. But David Miller, you nailed that. Nailed it, nailed it. Uh, Jack Torrance. Hello, Mr. Torrance. Or, Hello, Mr. Tor I can't do, I can't do, uh, can't do that. Uh, Jack Torrance says, the Overlook has Wi-Fi now. <laughs> Can Disney's Moon Knight be redeemed in your eyes in upcoming projects? Confirmed by Oscar himself. Be it a season two or an appearance in a movie, what are your thoughts? I would love to see Steven interact with other MCU characters. Jack, absolutely he can be redeemed. Uh, you know, here's the funny thing. Um, Moon Knight was introduced in the pages of Werewolf by Night. 
1975. That was when, when Moon Knight was first introduced. The Werewolf by Night show, the tone of it, would have been a far better place to introduce Moon Knight because the whole idea of uh, disassociative identity disorder, that was brought into the Moon Knight mythos way late. In my mind, Moon Knight, if I had made a Moon Knight show, I understand they've leaned into this, and a lot of people have done some really interesting things with his multiple personality disorder that came later. That would have been something I would I would have led up to, where Moon Knight has a psychotic break, and then you could get into that. I would have made Moon Knight a noir romantic. I mean, Moon Knight was a was a ripoff of Batman anyway, and he had his own Alfred in Frenchie, although. What he did have that was different than Bruce Wayne is he had one girlfriend. He had Marlene. And I would have leaned into that. I would have made Moon Knight a far more noir, romantic crime fighter that uh, leaned into those noir elements, those sort of sweeping romantic noir elements of the 40s. I mean, hell, if I had given my druthers, I would have made fucking Moon Knight in black and white and made it much more film noir. And, and relied on Chiroscuro lighting and, and all of that stuff. Leaning into the... Disas- and make him a badass character. And remember, in the comics, Moon Knight... There's Moon Knight. There's, there's Mark Spector, the original human being. There's Stephen Grant, his Bruce Wayne, rich playboy identity. And then there was Jake Lockley, who was a cab driver. And, 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 and when Mark Spector was Jake Lockley, he would little, literally drive around the city with his ear to the, the the concrete trying to pick up things if he could find crime and stuff like that he would go fight it so that's what I that's what I loved about Moon Knight um, and none of that was in the Moon Knight series so yeah I think it could be redeemed but when I watched when I watched um, when I watched uh, a werewolf by night I, I thought man it would have been great to have Moon Knight in this series it wouldn't have really worked in the story but that's I mean you could redeem Moon Knight I just don't like the version that was late Moon Knight. I would love to have seen an early '80s Bill Sienkiewicz Moon Knight, something in those along those lines, and we didn't get that. But that's okay. I still think he can be redeemed. It's a great question, Jack. Um, but yeah, hope springs eternal. Always, always hope springs eternal. Um, let's see who else is here. Um, Kinky Sphincter has been a member of the channel for 23 months. Thank you. Thank you, Kinky Sphincter. I appreciate that. <laughs> Blue and gold Throg. Throg, who kept my ass clean during the pandemic. Throg, how you doing? How is the family? How are you? Well, ain't this just a time capsule? Bong! It is, uh, but we're not during the pandemic. Throg used to send me giant... We couldn't get toilet paper for a while. He would send it to me from the East Coast. Throg is a good man. Uh... I like that. It is a time capsule. Chad Joyce says, uh, read JJ's book S. It is an experience. Set up as if you found a book with a ha- with handwritten notes in the margin. You follow the conversation suspense story of two readers via the notes and the book itself and the author's mystery. So he's leaning into the mystery box, which is fine. I think that's great. That's what he does. Um, yeah, I'm... I, that would I didn't read JJ's book S. I didn't know that was out. I'll I'll check that out. I mean, he loves that mystery box thing. Everything that they do is mystery box, and that's fine. But I get tired of it. I do get tired of it. Uh, some old guy in Hollywood. How are you doing, some old guy in Hollywood? Just saw Andor episode seven. God damn it! I need more. Well, you're gonna get more. You're gonna get five more episodes. You're gonna get episodes eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So that was kind of a standalone episode, and then they go back. They're setting up uh, episodes eight and nine, and ten are another three-part story, and then eleven and twelve are the climax. So there you go. Um, and on that note, everyone, I'm going to end this. Uh, I got to go finish the new episode of Designing Hollywood that will be up tomorrow with the costume designers of Black Adam. So look for that on the John Campia show. And I want to thank everybody for generously supporting this channel via Super Chats and Tips. Thank you for becoming a member of the channel. If you are a member of the channel, uh, know that this Saturday, Roberto Suarez will be hosting a member chat. Well, I will be there. So how we do that is anybody that comes into member chats that want to talk wants to talk to me, you put your hand up, and we just put you in the queue, and you get 10 minutes, 10 minutes to speak and uh, say your piece, 
and just talk to all of us. Talk to me. Talk to all of us. They're a lot of fun. We like to hang out. And, um, yeah. So, there we are. Uh, Matthew Hensley just sent in a uh, super sticker. Thank you, Matthew. Matthew, I appreciate that. Um, are you related to Pamela Hensley at all? The Princess Ardala from Buck Rogers? Um, don't know, but you're a member of the channel, so it's good to see you. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. I want to thank my moderating staff. I want to thank the great Tom Jr. Jackson. Yes, Tom, we will talk. We are all goof people. Thanks for moderating. Uh, Rob Observations will be back. I'm going to finally get to that horror episode tomorrow night. Uh, and again, if you want to send me letters, postgeeksingularity.com. And uh, it doesn't cost anything. Unless you want to write some long tome. It had to, we had to stop because people were writing these long letters. I'm like, over 500 words, you've got to change it. But uh, anyway, go to postgeeksingularity.com. You can send me a letter. I, of course, will be on the John Campia show tomorrow. We'll probably be doing an after show. Uh, Chris Carr and I did episode, pardon me, issue six of the Weekly Hero today. It went live tonight. Go check it out. Um, and yeah, there you go. That's all the news that's fit to print. I want to thank everybody again for being here. Thanks for, we're marching to 50,000 subscribers, which for me is a huge milestone. I got 50,000 more to get that YouTube plaque. So if in fact, um, if in fact you want to subscribe, that would help. I want to get to 50,000 just to say I got to 50,000. You know, you need these little accomplishments to keep you going. Anyway, thanks very much. And remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I would say to all of you that Fredo Valco Fredo Valcoz has been a member for three months. Hello, Fredo. You jump right in right before I ended. Every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I would say to all of you everywhere, have a better day. <laughs>